This video is brought to you by Wicket Cricket Manager. How great was Stuart Broad? I mean, that kind of has to be the question, right? Because his place in the Pantheon is not quite as straightforward as it should be. Stuart Broad is an incredible bowler. You cannot take as many test wickets as he did and not be. But he was not one of the greatest bowler of his era, and he was not always the greatest bowler in his team. His average is very good, but it's not great enough to make the case with any certainty. Stuart Broad has a complicated legacy, and I think it's popular to dunk on English players, and I get it, they get more attention than other cricketers, and the whole colonization thing. Broad could certainly grate on opposition fans as well, but does that mean that he wasn't an incredible and an all-time great? I think the question should be, how great was Stuart Broad? And for this, I will not be going into the incredible Stuart Broad theater in his position as the grand wizard of cricket memes. Obviously, I am completely obsessed with all that kind of stuff when it comes to Broad, but of course, I did a three-part documentary on that entire topic, so you're just gonna have to go over there. But for this, I just wanted to look at one thing. Where does Stuart Broad fit in with the greatest bowlers of all time? He has three obvious parts to his game that suggest greatness. Longevity, counting stats, and sprees. Stuart Broad took wickets in violent game and series altering rampages. His best days were an orgy of wickets. This is the one that starts a legend for Broad. England batted him at number seven in the series. They were still thinking about him as an all-rounder. And he came on third change in this match as pretty much an afterthought because Australia's openers were doing so well. The score was 73 for none when he started and Australia were 133 for eight when he finished his spell, five for 37. This proved that he had pace and movement and accuracy. Next up were India, who were coasting with Royal Dravid at Trent Bridge in 2011 when Broad took five for five. And it didn't just end that match, it basically ended the entire series. Around this period, those spells started to feel inevitable. New Zealand were chasing 239 at Lords in 14, they made 68. Broad took 7 for 40 for bowling unchanged. Australia were halfway to chasing 299 in 2015 with only a couple of wickets down. Broad didn't actually make the initial breakthrough. He just completely mopped up all the middle order and tail to ensure that they never even got close, and he ended with 6 for 50. That same series, England went in without Anderson at Trent Bridge and bowled first. The test was over before lunch as Broad took 8 for 15 and gave the world new means. And then there was the 6 for 17 against South Africa in what was shaping up as a close game until Broad just massacred them. His big spells didn't turn games, they ended them. And what I think makes all this amazing is how often Broad managed this in a five-man attack, especially when there was often plenty of quality bowling around. Like, Curtly Ambrose took wickets like this, but often it was only him and Courtney Walsh in the attack that were going to take wickets. There are some bowlers like Fuzzle Mahmood and Richard Hadley and Murali, but they did it because they didn't have any support. Broad did these sorts of things despite having a lot of other bowlers sharing the load. That shows that this was his main thing. But the reason he took wickets and sprees was because he was such a great combination of many different talents. He's very tall. He routinely has some of the highest release points in Test cricket. And he can use that to get a ball to jump up from a length, but also when he needs to bowl short spells. For his height, he can also get more swing than most bowlers. Sometimes when he does pitch it up, the ball is a little bit floaty, but this gives him another option. And at his pace and height, swing is a huge combination to have. Of course, like most taller bowlers, he can actually just hit the pitch. He's probably not a natural back of a length bowler like, say, McGrath or Ambrose. But again, it was something that he could use on the right day in the right conditions. And while he wasn't quite as accurate as them, and he could struggle with line and length sometime, it was nothing that massive, and he was still an above average placer of the ball. He could also move the ball in both directions. That is always a massive advantage for any seam bowler. Unless you have a Richard Hadley outswinger or a Courtney Walsh off cutter, you need the ability for the ball to go both ways. And he was fast. Never quite express, but he certainly was over 90 miles an hour when he got it all working. Think about all the different things I just said. That is an incredible combination. And when he got it right, he was basically unplayable, but he couldn't do that all the time. And there are probably three major reasons for this. One is he wasn't born a bowler. He was a batter until his late teens when a trip to Australia turned him from a friendly medium pacer into a quick. So unlike many of the best wicket takers of all time, he was probably not as grooved into his action at a young age, which meant that little things could go wrong for him. The next thing is that someone recently sent me an article where I described Stuart Broad as the Nick Cage of bowling. That was because Cage would take risks, perform erratically, pick terrible films, and often choose the wrong way to perform a role, overact, and then occasionally just perform so brilliantly that he makes the entire film. And of course, Nick Cage completely divided opinion. 
Braub was exactly like that with the ball. He was always tweaking or fiddling or looking for a way to change things. Whereas a grizzled, great fast bowler with his natural skills, usually would just try and hit the top of off stump for a long time. But ultimately, I think it's about coordination with Braub. When people would talk about his knees up, I think usually they were trying to say he's trying harder now. But I think he just had trouble finding his best rhythm. And his natural skills are still good enough that he was a threat even when he wasn't clicking. But when he was, his pace, bounce, accuracy, movement in one package, it was atomic. However, how great a bowler can you be if you regularly get dropped? This is the question I've had in my brain about Broad for years. But focusing on how often a player gets dropped is tricky, especially as England are pretty full on with their resting and rotating. Also, what does regular mean when it comes to drops? Because many players will be dropped as youngsters or might even miss the odd match as they get older. But I think what we're really looking for here is the players who are regularly dropped from ages 26 through to 34. And you'll be surprised to know that no one actually keeps stats on that. But there are a few times when Broad certainly missed out on form. He complained of an illness in India in 2012, but then bowling coach, who's now their bowling coach again, David Saker, made it clear that he thought form was his issue. So he was dropped for Stephen Finn there, who was obviously another tall, fast bowler, but not as skillful as Broad. In 2018 in Sri Lanka, he missed out again. And there are a couple of problems that Broad would run into when he was playing on Asian surfaces. One was that Anderson exists, and clearly he was always automatically going to get the first spot. And then England had all-rounders that can bowl seam. In goal for 2018, for instance, Broad was dropped because England had Sam Curran and Ben Stokes as their second and third choice seamers. They didn't need another seam ball. I think the Asian drops are less of an issue. The bigger ones are the three against the West Indies. The first at Bridgetown was a big deal even if Broad was straight back in after that. A year later, the same selector, Ed Smith, was dropping Broad again, this time at home against the West Indies. Broad did not really handle that all that well. And then he and Anderson were dropped together for the West Indies tour last year. That was not Ed Smith, so at least that bit had changed. But it was the West Indies again. He actually has a fairly ordinary record in the West Indies. He did play a lot of cricket there during the shit ball flat pitch era where like taking a wicket was like catching a fly in your teeth. But he wasn't dropped because of any of this. England just wanted to move on. They were never quite sure on him, even when he was an incredible bowler. So there is no doubt that Broad was dropped multiple times throughout his career. Of the bowlers with 400 wickets, there are actually quite a few who were dropped, but most of these were spinners from Asia when they were traveling away. Great seamers don't usually miss out on a spot. You look at all the guys with over 400 wickets and they were pretty much first choice, no matter what the conditions. But the guys just under 400 wickets, you do start to see that they get dropped a little bit. Guys like Southey and the Mitchells, Stark and Johnson. They just seemed to go through periods where the team was not feeling them. I think if you're going to be an all-time, all-world great, you usually don't get dropped this much. Although, most of those bowlers also don't go on to take 600 wickets. So he is confusing. I think another argument for his greatness has to come from the fact of his longevity. After Anderson, he has the most tests of a seamer ever. There are two ways to think about this, of course. One is to say that England played an extraordinary amount of test matches in this period. And so, of course, if he was fit and available, he was going to play a lot. But the other is, while that is 100% right, he still had to bowl all those overs and recover from more back-to-back -back test matches than anyone has ever thought of in history before. Bowlers like Courtney Walsh, Richard Hadley and Alec Bedser probably would have handled this workload similar to Broad did, but most seam bowlers just simply would not have. All that said, inside the actual games themselves, Broad had a pretty decent run of it. He's a long way down the list of balls per test list. England bowled him a lot, but they didn't actually overwork him that much. They milked the most out of him, even by resting him, despite the fact that he absolutely hated resting. But let me just highlight some players here. Broad bowled six overs a match less than Glenn McGrath, his idol. Now, of course, that was another era. What about someone who's played at the exact same time as him? Tim Southey. He bowled five overs a match less than him. And he was also a couple fewer than Anderson as well, who was at least closer to him on the list. So Broad didn't bowl that much inside the match. However, if you look at this by year, he still bowls a lot of overs. He's only bowled the most overs once for a seamer in a year, but he's been top five for every year of his career. And that is a lot of overs at the top level, no matter how you look at it. And because players don't play the same amount of tests, you have to look at span as well. And I think this really matters because if you have a player for 12 years, whether they play 60 tests or 110 tests because of your schedule, doesn't matter that much. What really matters is that for a long period of time, you don't actually need to replace them. You never find that many great bowlers, let alone test level ones. So the amount of years that they bowl really matters. Broad lasted 16. His mate Anderson, of course, makes that look a little bit silly. 
But when you look around Jimmy, you'll find a couple of all-rounders because they can extend themselves a little bit by batting. In fact, next to Broad is Kapil Dev. But you can see that on span, Broad is certainly at the heavy end of this. Seam bowlers simply do not last 16 years. That he did in an era where England was overworking their bowlers is absolutely remarkable. And it meant that the English team had two names penciled in for nearly every match for a decade and a half. But there were some things that started to help Broad with his longevity. England started to use Stokes, Archer, Wood, and even Wokes to bowl the dog overs between the 40 and the 80 over period. From 2014 on, Broad bowls 15% less overs than before. That all matters because those are the gut-busting spells, soft balls, flat pitches, and set batters. And having Spokes be a specialist for that period really allowed for Broad to bowl more when the ball was doing something. And he didn't have to worry about bowling fast, short bowling spells that usually kill seamen. But there are certainly things about his career that were not exceptional. And I think the most obvious one is probably wickets per innings. I would not expect him to be high on this list, but taking less than two wickets per innings is not an ideal thing for a great bowler to have. You see him down here on the list with the Asian seamers and all the all-rounders. He did have five bowling options in a lot of his tests, but so did many of the bowlers who were a lot higher than him as well. His number here is not terrible, but it's just not great. Also, Broad took a long time to get his wickets. I find this one more remarkable because some days it seemed like he was going to take a wicket every ball, but he's very much a bowler who took a long time to break through when he wasn't destroying entire innings in a single spell. But here's Broad versus the best batters in the world. Now he's known as a top order bowler, so I assumed he would do pretty well. There's clearly one massive elephant in this, Graham Smith. And a lot of the Graham Smith thing was just because Broad went against him so early when he wasn't a fully formed bowler. He was completely unaware of how to bowl to left hand at that point. That doesn't mean that Smith didn't eat him alive or that it doesn't count. So let's just remember that Smith averaged 200 against him and move on for a moment. Let's look at the others who averaged more than 50. Steve Smith, Manus Shane, and Raul Dravid, all top players. I don't think you can worry too much about them having the better of Broad. You also have Dean Elgar, Murali Vijay, and Mitchell on here. I think Elgar is the most surprising one, being that he's a lefty. And while he doesn't quite average 50, I just want to point out Craig Brathwaite, who averages more against Broad than he does against the rest of cricket, which I suppose explains why England kept dropping in for West Indies matches, although obviously not. But let's look at who he dominates. David Warner is obvious, but he was actually better against Michael Clarke when it comes to average. Shane Watson and Ross Taylor are two he was completely on top of. There's also Chandrapal, Yunus, Mizbah, and Rahane, who all really struggled against him. Although A.B. de Villiers was perhaps the one you will notice the most. He dismissed him in 50% of their contest. That is an incredible record against a player that good. And I cut all this off at 300 balls, but across nine innings against Sachin Tendulkar, the great man only averaged 13 against him. It is hard to look at this list and not think that there is an incredible bowler here. And one reason I think he does so well against top batters, other than just the obvious new ball skills, is the fact that he's a very good learner. This is brought against left-handers and right-handers throughout his career. The first year is basically ruined by Graham Smith. So for the second time, I'm going to take him out to show this all a little bit better. You can see that he works out right-handers pretty much straight away, probably because that came very naturally to him. But left-handers takes an age. He was actually assisted a little bit when he started to lose his wrist position, which actually allowed him to move the ball away from left-handers a little bit more naturally. But it was also the fact that he started coming around the wicket and also he changed the way he thought about left-handers. But the reason I'm showing this is that Broad was a bowler who got better throughout his entire career in almost every way because he was always thinking and learning. But that it did take him a long time to get this good also does separate him from a lot of the all-time greats. It took him an age to get his average under 30, 73 tests, which is the same number of matches that Mitchell Johnson played. Some of that time he was helped by his batting, although that was also slipping well before he was ever hit in the face. In his early part of his career, he actually gave England plenty of chances to move on from him, especially around 2012, but they didn't. And they, and also Broad, benefited from this. This is Broad and Jimmy together. Do you notice anything? Around 2012, they're both averaging basically 32. By 2014, they're under 30. So what happens here? I'm gonna guess it's three things. England step up their analysis, or at least their bowlers and coaches start to fully buy in. They become the smartest team in the world at this stage when it comes to their plans. That is gonna help a seam bowler out quite a lot. Also, though a little bit later in 2015, they don't have to worry about white ball cricket anymore. They just become red ball specialists. But I think the most major part of this is that Anderson, and also then Broad later on, perfects the wobble ball. By 2014, Anderson knows that ball well enough that he could start teaching it to others inside English cricket. And by 2017, we see a global drop start to happen. And in 2018, it's completely off the charts. 
the low bowling average against seam has stayed there for every year until this one. And we also know that the reinforced seam of the Kookaburra also played a huge part in this. But essentially, in this period, all the bowlers get better. But Broad's average drops ahead of this curve. By the time the dip happens, he's completely a star. Although he does have one year later on where he struggles a little bit during it. So unlike many modern bowlers, it isn't the pace playing pandemic that actually changes his numbers. But that is only because he was playing under those same conditions beforehand. Let's add his mate Anderson here as well. This is very interesting. The first couple of years he's bowling with Broad, he's marginally better than average. Then during England's great years, he dominates before slipping back to average again. Then from then on in, you can see after years of up and down, 2014, Anderson just drops. He's so much better than everyone else. And Broad joins him for these years. So if you look from 2014 to 2016, this reads like two guys who know something that no one else in cricket has worked out yet. Then as how the bowl, the wobble ball gets out, these guys are still really, really good, but everyone becomes really good. Just to jump back to Broad for a moment, I've split this up. The first section is him playing as an all-rounder through to the point when he's dropped versus India. You can see that he starts to dominate in that good batting period, and then he continues to do so when the place pandemic hits as well. So it is more than possible that Broad got better even before the wobble ball, because there is certainly a combination here of Stokes doing the dirty work, the analysts helping him, and just because he got older and he understood how to actually get wickets easier. But it's also very likely that the wobble ball played a huge part in this. He actually was the first bowler I heard to refer to himself as a wobble ball bowler. So from 2014 onwards, he was getting a huge advantage that the rest of the world wouldn't see for a while. But that is what teams do. South Africa won a test series on the back of one player working out a wrong one and just teaching a bunch of his provincial teammates. Broad still had to be good enough to be in the team at the time and then to use it. And he certainly did that perfectly. But the last thing to talk about is, of course, all those wickets. We could talk about the wobble ball, how he was dropped, Stokes helping his longevity, his wickets per innings and how the best batters in the world fared against him. You could certainly make an argument that Broad was the Courtney Walsh to Jimmy Anderson's Kirtley Ambrose. But let's just look at all those polls he took. There are two things that matter, wickets and how many runs they come out. 45 bowlers have taken between 200 and 300 wickets. Another 20 have between 300 and 400. 10 more, 400 to 500. Only two have 500 to 600. And only five players in the entire history of our sport have 600 wickets. One of them has 700 and the other 800. You can argue a lot of things about Broad's career, but being one of five bowlers and only the second seamer with 600 wickets is absolutely incredible. They don't give many away in test cricket. He had to stay fit, work out trends, bowl around the world, fight injuries, and just keep running in, no matter what. For most people, what will matter the most will be either wickets or averages. I think as a fan, you just have to work out where Broad fits in. But I have known enough seamers in my life to understand that taking 600 wickets at any level is absolutely incredible. To do it in test, mind-blowing. Yes, Broad was a Nepo baby with a freakish physical gifts who dropped into the most professional cricket culture in cricket history. He had access to sports science that other bowlers wouldn't even dream of. And he benefited from having an absolute bowling genius in his side. But none of that explains away running in 33,698 times and taking 600 test wickets. But averages do matter. And at the end, how many wickets you got for how many runs is basically how we look at test bowlers. And his record on that is just not as great as some of the others. And, that, and that's not a slight. Being Marshall, Hadley, McGrath, Garner, Wazim or Ambrose, that's God tier, right? And he's not there on average. He did bowl in a very tough era at the start of his career, but certainly not at the end. And you would have to say that he bowled a lot of matches in home with very nice conditions with a lovely, nice jukes ball. And in the end, Broad's average is 27.68. That probably isn't great enough for a seamer from England to be thought of as an all-world, all-time great. But because he played for 16 years, he certainly made a fair push at that. If he wasn't an all-time great, the many moments he left us with were. He was never the best bowler of his era or even his team but he was incredible theatre. Right before his final wickets that he ever took in Test Match Cricket, he was trolling Australia by taking the bails off and rehashing his own meme from a few days earlier. So often Broad was the story, but also conscious of how the world saw it. He was the lead actor and director of his own narrative. Whether Stuart Broad was just an England great or an all-time great is obviously subjective, but it would be hard to argue that Stuart Broad was great entertainment.